on camera. Today is Monday, February the 10th, 2020. My name is Roger Soyset. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center. Uh, <clears throat> with me is Sue Verhoff, Director of the Oral History and Genealogy at the History Center. We're here today to record the oral history of Mr. Pete Armstrong, who served in the U.S. Army during Vietnam, Desert Storm, and uh, numerous other locations. Uh, Mr. Armstrong's oral history is being recorded for the Atlanta History Center's Veterans History Project in partnership with the Library of Congress. We're honored to have you with us, Mr. Armstrong, and thank you for participating in the project. Uh, to start out, would you please state your full name and date of birth? Yes, good morning, Roger. It's Council Jordan Armstrong, Jr., and I was born on May the 19th, 1943. The uh, focus of our interview, of course, is to uh, center around your military career, but uh, we do need to have some information about your early years and uh, how it came about that you uh, chose the Army as a career. I was born in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, into a house full of people four generations. My great-grandmother, who was already bedridden and, and I knew very little of her, saw very little of her. Uh, my father's parents, their three children, their three spouses, and amongst the three were my older sister, myself, my younger brother, uh, two cousins from one aunt and one cousin from uncle. So I think that makes 14 of us living in the same house. How big was the house? Uh, big enough. It was uh, <laughs> three stories and large rooms, high ceilings, uh, fireplaces in each room, and it was quite comfortable and still stands today. It was built in the early 1920s, a uh, wooden frame house. And actually I considered about 15, 16 years ago buying it as it was on the market again, but sanity prevailed. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need that big of a house and, yeah. and it, it is old and it's wood, so it would have taken a lot of uh, attention. Is it on the Registry of Historic? It is not. Not. Uh, I'm not sure that very much of Rocky Mount, anything is on the Registry of Historic Buildings. Hmm. Uh, Rocky Mount is a, a town that when I was born was very heavily influenced by the tobacco industry. Uh, there was tobacco grown nearby. It was auctioned and I believe there were five tobacco warehouses in town, if I remember the history correctly. And the railroad uh, did both passenger and freight service through Rocky Mount shipping the tobacco. And of course the tobacco industry is all but dead in the U.S. and consequently so is Rocky Mount, North Carolina. Uh, until about 1975, I-95 uh, did not exist for about 50, 60 miles in North Carolina, yeah. specifically to keep the small towns alive. And they finally gave up and connected it uh, through the rest of North Carolina. And when they did, it just bypassed in any number of, of small towns in uh, Rocky Mountain for the most part, is nothing today. Main Street is just a series of abandoned, boarded up buildings. Uh, the few businesses that were uh, there have moved to the outskirts of the city near or the town, near to the uh, interstate. And I drive back through there periodically and it's, it's not the same town that I knew at all. Yeah. 
uh, lived there until I was, um, I guess, the first grade, 1950, we moved over to Tarboro, which is my mother's hometown. Uh, it's only about 12, 15 miles away from Rocky Mount. I started school there, and we were there for about a year, and then moved to Baltimore, where I, I went through um, public school system, graduated, and then uh, eventually joined the Army. Uh, Baltimore was a different experience. The, the experience of being a southerner going into the north was, was not great. Um, the struggle of, of going through school and being harassed by school teachers because of my southern accent was really not great. So, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, I graduated from Towson Senior High School in June of 1961 with an academic diploma. We, that time we had three types of diplomas, uh, commercial, secretarial, or general, and academic. But I graduated almost at the very bottom of my class uh, when I realized that my teachers were giving me a hard time in the second grade. I just sat there and shut up for the next 10 years and graduated. Uh, my saving grace was that I joined the Boy Scouts or Cub Scouts when I was uh, eight years old and I excelled in scouting and became an Eagle Scout and, and all the youth honors that there were to have. And that association continues t till today. Uh, this coming May I will have 69 years of registered membership with the Boy Scouts. Well, that must be close to a record. Well. There are some older guys, but, but not many. <laughs> My wife likes to go to uh, scout dinners with me because usually they will ask who's the oldest scout in the room and we get to go into the buffet line first. <laughs> uh, so I, I did start college out of high school, University of Baltimore. I did not want to. I wanted to go in the military. Uh, what year was this? Uh, 1961. Yep. So I was in high school, uh, in college for only a few weeks. Uh, dropped out, went to work for a couple of months uh, to pay off the tuition, which wasn't very much at the time. Uh, then joined the army on the 29th of January, 1962, which is what I wanted to do to begin with. Mm. I enlisted for airborne unassigned, which meant that I would go to jump school and be assigned uh, at the needs of the Army. I was programmed to go to both uh, basic combat training and light weapons infantry training. So by the time I got through jump school, I was uh, rated as a light weapons infantry uh, parachutist. Was this at Fort Benning or where were you? Uh, I, I spent three days at Fort Jackson, South Carolina getting uniforms. They made the decision that we would go down to Fort Gordon because they had just opened a training center because of the Berlin Wall and the uh, hostilities in uh, Europe. And they had had the MP school and the signal school, but they had not had basic training there in a long time since the Korean War. So I took basic training and uh, light weapons infantry training at Fort Gordon. At the end of that, got immediately onto a bus and went to Fort Benning for jump school. So how did you like Benning? Well, in that it was uh, 
July, <laughs> it was very hot. Uh, and I saw almost nothing of Benny except for the, uh, the three weeks in jump school. But I did go back to Benning two other times for the infantry basic course and advanced course, and then back to Georgia for my final assignment in the Army at Fort McPherson, where I was for about six months before mm -hmm. retirement. Well, in between, I guess we have some experiences. <laughs> uh, Vietnam in 1963, so that's coming right up, I guess. It is, but uh, even before I got to Vietnam, while I was in uh, basic training, I was not treated like I had been in, in grammar school. Uh, the Army said I had done well on my, um, I forget what the name of the uh, testing was, but the basic testing. Aptitude. That, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so I had done quite well. I was uh, number two uh, by test score in my basic training company, and my uh, company commander recommended that I go to West Point Prep School. Uh, I still wasn't ready to go to school. I, I went up there for a couple of months and left there and went to, uh, this is right after jump school, I, I went up there and uh, left there after two months and went to the 82nd Airborne Division, the uh, first 503rd, and I had been there probably less than two months when the, I think it was the evening of the 28th of November, 27th, 28th of November, 1962, I found myself sitting on a runway in Florida with a loaded weapon and a parachute, and we were going to go and invade Cuba. Yep. And thankfully, uh, President Kennedy came on the radio about 9 o'clock that night and said, you can stand down. And instead, I spent uh, my first Thanksgiving in the Army eating sea rations at Fort Bragg. They, because we weren't set up, they, they thought we were going to Cuba. And instead, we mm -hmm. went back to Fort Bragg. So they sent us straight into the field. And uh, we had ate the sea rations that we should have been eating in Cuba. And a couple of days later, they had prepared us to, to come back into garrison. And I was there in garrison for, that would have been November and July or August. I got orders for my first, July or August of the next year, 63. I got orders for my first tour to Vietnam. And I arrived in Vietnam on the 3rd of October, 1963. And what unit were you assigned to? Initially, I was in something called ACTIVE, the Army Concept Team in Vietnam. And the reason I ended up there is because at Fort Bragg, I had shared with them that I had uh, taken typing in high school. And they took me out of the rifle company at Fort Bragg and put me in the S2 office where I was preparing uh, background checks for a unit in our heavy mortar company. At that time we had heavy mortars. And we also had Davy Crockett weapon system. And the Davy Crockett was a nuclear weapon, Jeep mounted, and fired off the back of the Jeep. The small Davy Crockett would kill people on the far end. The big Davy Crockett had the same range, but a bigger blast area, so it would also kill the weapons crew that fired it. That was a real desperate <laughs> weapon to fire. Uh, so I was a, an airborne infantryman that could type with a TS clearance. So I got to, uh, when I got the orders to go to active, the, the concepts they were evaluating were a full range of, of things that we thought w would be interesting in the coming wars. Uh, 
helicopters, M113s, and special forces. And typewriters. And typewriters. <laughs> so I got there to be the, the clerk, the enlisted assistant to a special forces lieutenant colonel, and then they decided that they were not going to evaluate the special forces. So I was without a job, and after a couple of months, I ended up going out to the um, advisory detachment to what was then the Vietnamese Airborne Brigade, later became an airborne division, and I spent the rest of that tour with those folks. What was your impression of the Vietnamese Airborne? The Vietnamese Airborne, as were many Vietnamese soldiers, were good soldiers. I, I really enjoyed working with them. Uh, the colonel brigade commander at the time uh, eventually became the chief of staff of the joint staff of the Vietnamese Army. And they were competent people, very competent people. The soldiers had a fighting spirit. I went to the field with them, although I was, theoretically, I was the clerk. Uh, I did everything. I, I, I soldiered with them. Was that kind of your choice? or? Well, it was my choice to go out there and take the assignment. It was an interesting uh, eight, nine months for me in that I was one of 29 Americans assigned to the detachment. There were 26 U.S. Army advisors, two Air Force forward air controllers, and me. I drove a Jeep. I got the mail. I carried a radio. I proved how inept a, a typist I really was. And that really, I tell people that that year I grew up in Vietnam, because in that, that very small amount of time, I did things and experienced things that outside of Boy Scouts I never did at home. Um, because I was the the gopher, the flunky, whatever, uh, the next youngest American in the detachment was 10 years older than I was, and he was a senior NCO. And even then, or maybe especially then, the Army did not uh, mix very well. We still had enlisted clubs, NCO clubs, officer clubs, on post, so I didn't have anyone in the detachment that I was close to. I got to know the sergeant just next door who was the driver for the Vietnamese brigade commander, and he and I are still very good friends. He lives in California now, and I would go with him in the evenings. All of the Americans would go home, and if they thought that I might be finished my work, they would offer to drop me off. Otherwise, they'd just walk out and leave me. And that was fine with me. I'd so, consequently, I learned to speak Vietnamese by going with him specifically, but with the Vietnamese soldiers. And the ability to speak Vietnamese led to many opportunities that most American soldiers did not experience in Vietnam. Yeah. As a staff sergeant, I met and became friends with the prime minister because my friend, the Vietnamese sergeant, had grown up to become his bodyguard. and. Uh, that was Nguyen Cao Ki, the, uh, the famous air marshal mm -hmm. who passed away a couple of years ago in Malaysia. Uh, I've been to his home. 
I've been to Vietnam with him. I, I had a very different experience in Vietnam than most Americans, I think. Yeah. And it was because of that first year where I learned to speak the language. That was one thing I always was disappointed in the Army about, the fact that there was no real effort to have the language of Vietnam uh, taught to us, even a rudimentary, uh, before going to Vietnam. Uh, did, you didn't have any classes prior to going there? I, I had Nothing. none because yeah. my duties as a clerk in the unit active had no demand for it. Mm -hmm. So that would have just been a cost the Army wasn't willing to pay at the time. Yeah. So mine truly was uh, immersion and later on I'll, I'll speak of my special forces experiences but uh, the language helped me with that as well. But in special forces we have a saying that the easiest way to learn a language is either with a long-haired or a pillow dictionary. And I'll leave the interpretation of that to your imagination. <laughs> I have no comment. <laughs> I will tell you that I was married to a Vietnamese and I'm now married to a Korean. So again, you can, your own imagination. Okay, you have a number of tours here. Were they back to back? Did you have time yeah. between postings? So in my first tour ended in October of 1964, I was intending to extend and re-enlist. Actually, I'd already done the extension papers. And my father developed lung cancer. Uh, he had uh, also been born in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. And as a, a product of that town, he started smoking when he was eight years old, and he died at 45 years of age, still smoking. He, he just couldn't give it up, even as they carved him up, because they didn't understand chemo and yeah. all these other therapies. That all they knew was a knife and yeah. cut him several times. So that tour ended in uh, October of 64, I came home, I got out of the Army because by then they had, I had matured a bit, uh, they had approved the concept of the GI Bill and I moved down to the University of Texas and where I was going to go to school and live with a couple of guys I would served with in the Army and then I realized or I knew it was coming, but they had not approved the funding for the GI Bill. It, it had been approved, but there was no money for it yet. So I decided to go back in the Army. Uh, I rejoined in February, I was only out about a month, rejoined in February and immediately volunteered to go back to Vietnam. Uh, so I started my second tour, got there in May of 65, and that tour lasted until March of 66. My boss, again, had seen potential and wanted me to go to OCS. I filled out all the paperwork, applied, was accepted, but accepted as an engineer OCS candidate. And I knew my limitations on math and science skills, but the Army says, no problem. Uh, we need lots of people. We just need people to get this class full so we can get the school running. I was in one of the first classes at Fort Benning, or Fort Belvoir for Engineer OCS. And We had been in class only a couple of weeks and they announced that all of us were in fact going to be engineers. And I knew better than that. So I left and 
since I was in the vicinity of the Pentagon, I went over and knocked on a guy's door and went from engineer OCS to special forces training. And I was already a staff sergeant by then. So I went uh, to operations and intelligence school. And that started a, a long path for a number of years. I finished that school in, I guess, November of 65, 66 by then, yeah, and at that time there was a lady at the Pentagon by the name of Billy Alexander who was responsible for all enlisted Special Forces assignments, and I submitted my preference to go to Vietnam, although had, at, at graduation I was assigned a third group at Fort Bragg, and I got a note from Mrs. Alexander said, you can't volunteer to go to Vietnam, you're already on orders. So. Surprise. <laughs> third tour. <laughs> <laughs> so I was uh, there in Vietnam and I went to uh, a special unit called Mac Sog Military uh, Assistance Command Vietnam Studies and Observation Group. Everybody knew it meant Special Operations Group, but it was a, a nice cover story that we were a staff office. And I, uh, for about six months, I did cross-border reconnaissance, and all of this is now declassified. Uh, nobody contacted me and told me I didn't I couldn't say anything about it, but I keep reading books about it, so. What part of uh, South Vietnam was this? Uh, SOG had three camps at the time, and actually we were assigned to 5th Special Forces Group Headquarters Company with duty uh, for SOG. So I was in Fubai. There was another camp in Kantum and a camp in Pleiku. So mm -hmm. I was at the what uh, they were called uh, FOB 1, 2, and 3. Mm -hmm. I was at FOB 1. They later became uh, CC North, CC uh, Central, and CC South. Yeah. So I was there at, uh, at Fubai for about six months. And then because I had trained as uh, the ONI Operations Intelligence, I got moved down to Da Nang to be the uh, S2 NCO, the Intel NCO, for all of the FOBs. My primary duties were to debrief the recon teams, and we were going in, at that time, we were going into Laos, Cambodia, and the DMZ area, uh, separating North and South Vietnam. No other military operations were authorized to go cross border except for us. And that's why we all had top secret clearances and and everything was deniable and no ranks. No Did you have to take off uh, any uniform designations? Yes. And, no yeah. dog tags, yeah. okay. no ID cards, n nothing on the uniforms. And we actually, in, in camp in Fubai, were like that for the most part, which aggravated the heck out of the Marines and, and other Army units that were in the area. But, okay with me. <laughs> um, I actually made Sergeant First Class on that assignment. I'd been in the Army only five years and four months when I made Sergeant First Class. Wow. And they came back several months later and said, whoops, you're supposed to have at least seven years. So if you stay in Vietnam, stay in the same unit, we'll reinstate we won't give you any back pay, but we'll reinstate the grade. Well, I had been there for almost another year, and uh, by then it was uh, Tet of 68 had happened, uh, Tet Motam, and we had a lot of casualties, 
the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese had targeted our recon teams in garrison. A lot of them lived outside the fence with families in towns and whatnot. So they had been targeted specifically. So there were uh, a couple of us, again because of the Vietnamese language ability, uh, I was moved down south uh, outside of uh, Tonsonut Air Base and I was recruiting uh, people to go and, and fill these vacancies on the recon teams, Vietnamese specifically, but anybody that I could find. Were the recon teams primarily uh, South Vietnamese? No, they were not. And actually, <coughs> uh, up until that time, we had some South Vietnamese, but by Vietnamese law, the Vietnamese were not allowed to go into special operations. Theoretically, they would go into the Army and support us, and we had some all Vietnamese teams, but those that went with the Americans were supposed to be either Mountain Yard or leftover Chinese that had come down at the end of the Second World War. And, and we had mixes. It, I had a, a team at one point that had a couple of Chinese, a couple of Vietnamese, and one uh, mountain yard, which was interesting to, for them to talk together to one another. Would any of these be categorized mercenary? Theoretically, all of them were. Uh, the Vietnamese were categorized as deserters from the Vietnamese army because they, they were supposed to join the Vietnamese Army. So nobody ever got in trouble for it that I knew of, but, but that was their designation. Yeah. So that was, uh, there were about five or six interesting months that I was recruiting these folks. The culmination of the recruitment came right at, at my reassignment I had encountered a Cambodian battalion commander and he wished to bring his Cambodian battalion over and work for us. And he was caught between the North Vietnamese occupying Eastern Cambodia and the South Vietnamese not liking Cambodians particularly at all. And Historically they had a few issues. They had a few issues, yes. and. I was doing a lot of my travel and recruitment in civilian clothes. So going in and out of Anlock, which was uh, northwest of Saigon, to collect these Cambodians, the Air Force folks knew me. They'd seen me in uniform, they'd seen me in civilian clothes. Our Air Force or? Our Air Force. Yeah. Okay. So the, uh, my final trip up there, The Air Force Sergeant says, Sergeant Armstrong, this Sergeant so-and-so, I think he was from the 1st Infantry Division, would like to fly to Saigon with you this morning. Sure. And the guy looks at me and says, Sergeant Armstrong? He says, yeah, yeah that's okay. <laughs> I have a uniform someplace. <laughs> so we walked over to the end of the airfield there at Anlock, and eventually, uh, a Special Ops C-123 lands, and the C-123s that were supporting us actually belonged to the Republic of China, Taiwan Air Force. And on the side of the airplane, instead of the stencil with the American markings, they had what essentially was a license plate holder. <laughs> and they would use the appropriate license plate for the appropriate occasion. So the airplane lands and this uh, Chinese crew chief gets off. Sergeant Armstrong, Sergeant Armstrong. And he runs over and hands me a briefcase. 
and I opened it to make sure what's in the briefcase and it was full of money as it should have been. <laughs> so I'm getting more and more looks from this poor guy from the 1st Infantry Division. And he opens a ramp and I don't know how many Cambodians got in the airplane. Way more than they had seats, but that was good because they didn't have any seats in it anyway. Everybody sat on the floor. And one poor old Vietnamese woman who had been feeding these guys for two weeks as I'd been gathering them up. And we're sitting on the ramp, the airplane takes off, and the Cambodian colonel, who spoke some French and a little Vietnamese and a lot of Cambodian, and myself who spoke a little French, a lot of Vietnamese and English, and Mama, who spoke only Vietnamese, we worked out the deal how much I owed her for feeding these guys. And I opened the bag up and just reeling off money, and now the sergeant is just, he's gone. But it got worse. We landed in Saigon, and my boss, driving a U.S. Embassy vehicle, resplendent in his captain's uniform, came to pick me up. That's the last I saw of the sergeant. He just walked away. <laughs> I have no idea what he did. He asked for a ride, he got a ride. But then, uh, it was just a few days later, I was called again by Mrs. Alexander and said, <clears throat> we have a requirement for someone, Special Forces Staff Sergeant, who has been in your unit, who has the clearance, et cetera, et cetera, and you're the only one in the Army. You're going to Hawaii. So I got sent from Vietnam in May of 1968 to Hawaii, which upset me for several reasons. Uh, first of all, I just lost my promotion to Sergeant First Class because I was no longer in the unit. And by then I had uh, more than six years service, so only a few more months and I would have qualified under their seven year retroactive, well, you'll be good. So I got to Hawaii as the ops sergeant for a unit called J3A3, which was in the uh, sink pack J3 section and we covered special operations in Southeast Asia. Specifically, Mac Sog was the biggest, but also the SEAL operations and some other stuff. And I had a boss by the name of Butch Kendrick, full colonel at that time, and Butch had been a lieutenant in one of the first airborne courses at Fort Benning in the Second World War. And he had the third award of the Combat Influence Badge. He had already been in uh, Second World War, Korean War, mm -hmm. and Vietnam. So that office was uh, pretty small and intense. We had maritime operations, aviation operations, ground operations, and some other stuff that to this day uh, I believe is still classified and I've not read about any of that which is interesting that we got away with something. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Kendrick sat me down and said, uh, okay, here's the deal. You're going to work 4 a.m. to noon seven days a week. You're the only guy with this job and it's a seven day a week job. And I think that you should go to school and you have plenty of time to do that in the afternoons and evenings. So that's when I started. I, yeah, 24 hours a day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, finished my freshman year at University of Hawaii. I was in that assignment for 13 months. And for the first 10 months, I was the only one there and then they brought in a guy that they thought was going to replace me, and 
uh, he was actually on convalescent leave from uh, Max Og, and it just turned out that he in too bad a shape to come back to active duty. So then they brought in the guy that eventually replaced me. So I was there for 13 months and then went right back to Vietnam. And by now it, it had become CCN rather than FOB1. CCN? Command and Control North. Okay. Uh, yeah. The, the ground operation of MAXOG. So in the meantime, my younger brother had enlisted in the Army. And he wanted to, he's five and a half years younger than I, uh, he wanted to do basically what I had been doing and he ended up being in the uh, headquarters of the 82nd as a young man. And then he got orders for Vietnam. And he said, uh, my brother's already on orders for Vietnam and we're sole survivors. One of us can't, hmm. not supposed to go. And they, I think he said, they said, shut up boy and get on the bus or something to that effect. Anyway, he ended up in Vietnam. So I ended up back in Vietnam in, in July of 69. And I said, well, I really don't want to go back north. I want to go down south. And even though I was a very senior staff sergeant by then, some smart aleck clerk said, shut up, sergeant, you're going to go where I tell you to go. I said, oh, by the way, I want to go home. What? Said, well, I got a brother in country, and I'm the sole survivor, so both of us can't be here. Well, well, well. I said, but if you assign us together, we'll, we'll both stay. So he and I both ended up in Da Nang. And we were there together for about six months. Unfortunately, that time in Da Nang, uh, CCN had been overrun there August before, so it had been almost uh, just at a year. And they had 17 or 18 people killed in one night. So the only squadron flying Agent Orange missions flew out of Da Nang. And our compound was the very southern compound still within the geographic area of Da Nang. We weren't really, I mean, it was, it was kind of isolated, but. How far away, you think? Uh, we were 10, 12 miles okay. south of Da Nang. Yeah, it's a so, big base, but not that big. Exactly, yeah. So as a favor to us, the Air Force, as they flew out in the morning, would spray our camp <laughs> to keep the vegetation down. My brother passed away 12 years ago, Agent Orange. And he was only 59 and a half wow. by the time he did it. And he was a lot smarter than I am. I'm just not smart enough to get sick, I guess. I'm rated at 145% disability. I draw 80% pay. But thankfully, it, it hasn't been nearly as tough on me as it was on him. I've had a couple of cancers and, and other things. Mm -hmm. but uh, so we stayed there in Da Nang together for, from July until, I guess, March. And they were giving me a hard time uh, about a couple of things. I, I did not care for the camp commander. I didn't dislike him enough to shoot him or frag him, although somebody did try. But um, the camp commander was not a special forces officer. He was a, um, a regular West Point graduate. And up until that time, there had been very few West Point graduates assigned to the special ops. But 
the theory being that they were too schooled in the book to do nasty stuff, unorthodox stuff. So um, the commander and I weren't seeing uh, eye to eye, and it ended up that he got thrown out of the Army as a very decorated lieutenant colonel because uh, his decorations were all bogus. He was writing them for himself because he thought the Special Forces assignment was going to impede on his career advancement. But that's okay. He's also dead. He died of natural causes early. <laughs> but uh, so I applied for a job that was opening at SOG headquarters in the PSYOPs uh, operation. And again, because I spoke the language, I was able to do some stuff on the ground. Again, travel in civilian clothes. I worked very closely with the uh, CIA and the U.S. Embassy and the other U.S. agencies in Saigon. And I, I worked, I lived in Saigon uh, in an apartment that I rented out of my own pocket rather than in a hotel that was a, a target because they had blown up several uh, enlisted quarters. I had made Sergeant First Class in the meantime, uh, and I was running around all over the country in civilian clothes and, and doing some really interesting stuff, and it's that stuff that's still not declassified. Got to ask, did the CIA ever attempt to recruit you? No would be the most accurate answer. Uh, although I did, uh, while I was still on active duty, I did do some briefings to the CIA about stuff that they did in Vietnam and had forgotten um, or didn't, didn't record well. But my brother did, in fact, work for the CIA for a couple of years after he uh, got his Ph.D. Um, I, I really had no interest in working for the government as a civilian. I would have even less today. I just don't. Yeah. I, I don't want to get political in the middle of this, but I think President Trump is absolutely right. Washington is a swamp. It just, it bothers me a lot. And I, I would not care to be there. So uh, it was at this time, uh, uh, during the uh, working in the PSYOPs office, and then later in the ground operations offices and operations sergeant, uh, a guy by the name of uh, Dan Shungle recommended me for a field commission. And Shungle's name should be familiar to historians of the Vietnam era because he was the commander of Charlie Company, uh, 5th Special Forces Group out of Da Nang, when the camp at Lang Bay was overrun during Tet of 68, and Shungle was outside of the wire of the camp uh, doing stuff all night long and received a Distinguished Service Cross for his efforts that night. A uh, well-deserved Distinguished Service Cross. How do you spell his name? S-C-H-U-N-G-E-L or L-E? E-L, I believe it is. He uh, eventually made full colonel and went to uh, an operation in the Pentagon in the Joint Chiefs called SAXA. Special Assistant Counterinsurgency Activities, I think it was. And he retired out of there as a full colonel uh, with many, many years of service. I believe he also had uh, three combat infantryman's badges. So I, after having 
quit prep school, quit OCS. I wasn't smart enough to decline the commission, and life went downhill for the next six years. <laughs> Having been a sergeant first class in charge of a lot of stuff, a lot of money, uh, very sensitive operations. I became a platoon leader in an airborne rifle company in Panama and as a reserve lieutenant I was still a regular army sergeant first class because they had as a reservist I uh, they had to ensure if anything happened I, I would revert to my your permanent Regular, rank. Permanent rank. Yeah. So the only person in the company that outranked me truly was the first sergeant. And uh, had a real idiot for a company commander. Uh, very unsure of himself, very egotistical, and he looked like a sad sack comic, uh, considerably smaller than I in, in stature and height, and he wore 13 double E jump boots and stuffed the ends of them with paper so that the toes would curl up. He truly looked like a, a comic book character. Uh, he made full colonel, I didn't, so what can I say about the Army? West Pointer? No. Uh, he really was a graduate of Slippery Rock State University in Missouri. That exists. <laughs> it does. <laughs> <laughs> and his, his master's or his uh, major was PE. So he knew how to run. And, but I think the only reason he made full colonel was his battalion happened to be at the Jungle Warfare Training Center when Just Cause broke out in Panama. So he was a battalion commander in combat. <laughs> but I have no idea where he is today. And The highlight of my service with him, and it's still remembered by the other two lieutenants, we were out in the middle of the jungle one day doing a recon in a jeep. Driver two brand new West Point Lieutenant Airborne Rangers, company commander, so I got to sit on the, the transmission hump in the Jeep. Really, really miserable outside. And the captain jumps out and says, let's go Rangers. And I jump out and pull the seat up. Two lieutenants get out, I put the seat back down and got back in the Jeep. I wasn't a Ranger. <laughs> he never forgot that. <laughs> Nor did the two lieutenants. I just did what he told me to do. <laughs> uh, that was not a very good tour. The 193rd Infantry was a, a unit in chaos uh, because it had been ignored all during the Vietnam War. Uh, I got there, they, the company only had one lieutenant when I got there, so they were short three, four. They were short all, all the platoon leaders, mortar and, and three mm -hmm. platoon leaders. Uh, the rest of the battalion was in the same shape. Uh, the battalion commander. I had been in the battalion just for a couple of days, and the battalion commander's wife dropped him off and recognized me. I guess she had a roster of who was new. And said, oh, Lieutenant Armstrong, I have to come up to the house for a drink. <laughs> it's only eight o'clock. You mean right now? <laughs> uh, uh, he and she together went through a lot of alcohol. When I went to Panama, uh, 
I had stopped at my assignments officer on the way down because I was on leave in Baltimore, so I stopped and visited to see what life was going to look like after Panama, see if I could uh, maybe go to school and finish up my bachelor's because I didn't have one yet. And after a 45 minute session with my assignments officer, all of a sudden he says, oh, you're Armstrong. Shuffled around on his desk, pulled out a letter. He said, I was going to mail this to you when you got to Panama. He says, uh, we've decided not to uh, continue your commission after your two years, so you'll be separating from the Army in Panama. <laughs> okay. The fellow who had sent me to OCS uh, was an AG officer. I worked for him in, in Da Nang in 1965-66. Uh, he had never forgotten me. He would write to me. And he had written me not long before I was supposed to get out of the Army. And he said, uh, I understand you're getting out of the Army, or you're not going to be a lieutenant anymore. If you'd like to stay in the Army, I'm going to Washington, D.C. Uh, in the Office of Congressional Liaison. Stop by and see me and I'll see what I can do for you. Well, in the meantime, a, a friend of mine from CCN, who had uh, also been a lieutenant there, uh, had reverted back to Sergeant First Class and had learned of a program. The Army had slashed its ranks so desperately that it needed combat service and combat service support officers and was looking for uh, combat arms officers to branch transfer over. So I, I wrote Colonel Wilson back and I said, well, if you really want to help me out, make me an AG officer. And in the meantime, I had, uh, I was right on the cusp of finishing my degree, which is another whole story I'll, I'll tell you in a second. Uh, so Colonel Wilson says, well, meet me at such and such door at the Pentagon on such and such date and we'll see what we can do. So I applied for leave to come home from Panama to do that and it was approved. And I had my leave papers, and somebody came up to me in the company area and said, Captain so-and-so, the guy with the funny boots, uh, has withdrawn your leave. So that's too bad. He didn't really. He just thought he had. So I got on the airplane and came back to the States <laughs> and met... Uh, Colonel Wilson, and we went into the Pentagon that morning, and he took me in, I think the guy's name was Pete Walker, AG Branch Chief. It was Pete something. He says, uh, Pete so-and-so, Pete so-and-so, he'd like to be one of us. And the Branch Chief calls out to Susie and says, come in here a second. Make this guy a, an AG officer. Yes, sir. So she leaves to go make me an AG officer. What else can I do for you? I said, well, actually, sir, I'm uh, supposed to get out of the Army in a couple of weeks. Call Susie back in and said, make him an indefinite AG officer. <laughs> so I went back to Panama a couple of days later, having been AWOL, according to the company commander. And uh, I no longer belonged to the company and no longer belonged to the brigade and was an AG officer and got reassigned to uh, U.S. Army South at the, the headquarters there. So the reason that I was able to do that was because when I got to Panama, having been told that I was getting out of the Army, it wasn't my real intention to try to stay in the Army, but it was my real intention to graduate from school. <laughs> 
So I hooked up with Florida State University, who had just taken over the contract to run evening classes. University of Maryland had been doing it for years. University of Maryland was not enthused about doing it in, in Panama because they were a small operation. Uh, Florida State uh, was looking at the future and was hoping to educate uh, Latinos uh, with a U.S. degree so eventually they could take over the country and take over the running of the canal, etc. So I said I had gotten my bachelor's, or my uh, freshman year at University of Hawaii. When I went back to Vietnam, uh, even when I was running recon, there was a University of Maryland operation not far from us at uh, the first log command's headquarters. So if I was in town, I'd go to class at night. Otherwise, I'd do my homework and study. <laughs> I managed to get my sophomore year with the University of Maryland. So I got to Panama, and Florida State looked at my uh, transcripts, didn't make me take any classes over. So I had my uh, sophomore finished. Then they looked at my military experience and, and classes and gave me my junior year. <laughs> and I had done a few classes here, there, and the other places. So almost immediately upon arriving in Panama, I went to school five nights a week and Saturday morning. And it, in 12 months, I finished my senior year at Florida State. So you're a Seminole. I am Seminole, class of 73. And my graduating <laughs> class in Panama, it was the first year that Florida State had been there. So my graduating class was 17 people. And I may have been the only non-Latino in the class, but I'm not sure of that. But I was the first Army guy to graduate from that program. And I've been back to visit since then. Uh, we were all night classes at that time, and Florida State now has about 350 full-time day students from all over Latin America, and they've actually got some old housing in one of the military bases that uh, they can put up their students in. So it's quite an operation. And only a few of their classes are night classes now. But Florida State was very good to me in that time and space. So I've been pretty good to them since then. Yeah. As good as I can be. I, I survived Panama. I, I survived being an AG officer. And when the opportunity returned, I went back to infantry. Uh, when I was in the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, went to the advanced course, and by then it was uh, January 1977. I arrived in Korea and specifically asked to be a company commander on the DMZ of Korea, and I was there for 15 months, and that was just uh, it was absolutely the best year that I spent in the Army. It was just like basic training, except that I was in charge as a company commander. Uh, I had pass policy, and I was a headquarters company commander, so very much to the chagrin of the battalion commander and the battalion XO, I owned things that they had to use. <laughs> like and, what? Hmm? Like what? Oh, the mess hall. <laughs> amongst others, and I owned all the vehicles, and <laughs> they had to ask you. <laughs> they had to ask me. And the battalion commander I actually went through four battalion commanders in that tour. First one got relieved for incompetence just as I was arriving. He had failed the IG twice. Uh, the next one had come out of the Pentagon and was uh, real politically connected, 
his uh, wife was an aide to a congressman. Uh, that didn't help him when uh, we had a pre-IG meeting and the brigade commander asked where my battalion commander was and I said, I'm not sure. Uh, it turned out that he was in bed with a prostitute uh, on a Saturday morning and since we were in the DMZ, that was denied area and he had lied about her ID card and said she wasn't in the area anymore. And Monday afternoon, he was no longer the battalion commander, and everyone swore that I had done it. But I would have, but <laughs> didn't have to. <laughs> didn't have to. <laughs> then we had two, two more that followed him, and they were both very, very good guys. Um, but the, um, that was truly the the best year I spent in the army. I, I carried a weapon in garrison more than I ever did in Vietnam. Uh, there was a higher threat. Uh, my orderly room looked straight into North Korea. Uh, there were people killed on the DMZ while I was there. Was that the incident with the uh, wood choppers? Uh, they were killed just shortly before I arrived. Uh, my first sergeant had been, he was a special forces medic amongst other things. Uh, he had treated those two guys. Yeah. Uh, there was a helicopter shot down. Uh, there were a couple of uh, individual shootings. Uh, it was, it still is a, a nasty place. I've been there recently. All along the southern side of the DMZ, it's all peace, love, and harmony. Uh, there's the opportunity to cross into the, the northern side, which I did recently couple of years ago. Uh, I didn't see any of that propaganda on their side. Uh, the South would very much like things to be different. The president of South Korea was born in North Korea hmm. and and has said that a lot and and would like like harmony. I don't know if it'll come or not. Uh, but by then uh, gotten over the rifts from Vietnam, the reductions in forces. Uh, as I said earlier, I survived the first six years. It was really tough. When I got commissioned, they were holding the first reduction board for Vietnam. So they were throwing West Point officers out and I was surviving. So and They needed you. They did. <laughs> and actually, I truly believe uh, my majors board, for instance, was a long time running. And one of the reasons is because someone in the Army leadership sent it back and said, we need more people with field experience to be promoted to major. And later, I surprised a lot of people when I made lieutenant colonel, and I think, again, that was the same reason. And then later, just before retirement, uh, they had introduced the CERB board, Sele Selective Early Retirement Board, and the board in January of 1992, which I was reviewed for, was the harshest board that they had had, more people were selected for retirement than any other boards prior to that. I was not selected. And then my promotion board for full colonel met three months later, but I had already submitted my retirement papers. In fact, I walked off post at Fort McPherson the day my colonel's board met. But I, over 30 years service, I. Had did had you enough. know that board was meeting? I did, yeah. yeah. I didn't know it was that specific date, but... And anyway, as a Special Forces officer, uh, the commander at Fort Bragg had said that everyone in Special Forces was expected 
to pass the PT test at the 17-year-old ranger level. <laughs> and I couldn't, <laughs> that meant 80% or higher. I couldn't do 80% at the 47, 48-year-old level. There was no way I was going to go out there and run around the block with 17-year-olds. So, and I was sick and I was a yeah. uh, bunch of exposures and I was in Desert Storm for 10 and a half months and lived in an oil cloud for three months of that. It, I wasn't in good shape. More than happy to go home. Uh, Desert Storm is one aspect of your career you have only touched on. You want to give us a little more depth? I ain't the dumbest guy on the bus. I was teaching at Fort Lee in the quartermaster school. I was chief of leadership branch. Uh, back up a little bit. There's a reason why I was at Fort Lee. Same reason I was at Fort Sheridan. Uh, when I was in Germany, I was the battalion EXO of a special forces battalion. And the battalion commander had divided it out. The only responsibilities I really had was um, personnel, logistics, and the medical. And one morning, Sergeant First Class, his wife, children, and dog arrived at the train station. And we had no space for him, no requirement for him. So it was my duty to pack him up and send him back to Frankfurt for, for the Army to figure out where he should be. And when I did that, I sent a message to the Army, to the guy at Fort Bragg, to the guy in the Pentagon that responsible for sponsorship, and a couple of other addressees. And the guy at Fort Bragg, two-star, said, no, you're wrong. That couldn't have happened. So the battalion sergeant major, the battalion commander, and the 10th group commander all said, the general's right. That couldn't have happened. You're wrong. And shortly thereafter, another major got assigned to the post. There were only five, only four majors positions and when a fifth one came in, the senior major had to go out. That was me. <laughs> I don't think that was circumstance. I think it was planned, but that's okay. So I got sent to, uh, by now I was on the, major, or the lieutenant colonel's list, and I got sent to a major's position at Fort Sheridan, Illinois. And as a, an advisor to reserve and National Guard troops. So I went there for three years. Uh, the first 18 months, that was my job. It was very unrewarding. Uh, I had obligations to go to Fort Bragg and report about the, they had a, a number of special operations units there, Special Forces PSYOPs and Civil Affairs. And I would go to Fort Bragg, and nobody at Fort Bragg would even talk to me. <laughs> because the general said, you know, he just doesn't exist anymore. And, and I was specifically told that you will never be assigned to Fort Bragg again. So I spent three years at uh, Fort Sheridan, uh, 18 months in uh, the advisory role, and then 18 months as garrison battalion commander. And then it was time to leave Fort Sheridan, and Desert Storm broke out. And I had seven sets of orders in about one week because units kept moving around. And none of those orders had to do with special forces. So I ended up 
going by now I was a lieutenant colonel with several years in grade and an experienced battalion commander I ended up going to Fort Lee as a major in a major's position I'd been there for about a month and I went to lunch one day and I got back from lunch on a Thursday and I did not have lunch on Friday. I was gone. The airplane I got onto to go to Desert Storm had 32 lieutenant colonels, all straight from the schoolhouse. All combat arms officers. We were the replacement battalion commanders that they expected to lose in the, in the first wave. Nobody ever said that until I recently read a book by Major General Bob Scales, and I don't remember the name of the book now, but he alluded to that, that they had moved all these extra guys in. Well, in fact, they didn't lose anybody. They didn't lose a battalion commander at all. So we were there without jobs. I was a special forces guy. I wasn't going back to Fort Bragg. And they didn't know what to do with me, so they left me there for ten and a half months. Um, there was a, a unit at, excuse me, at Fort McPherson, part of the Third Army, called the 5th Special Operations Support Command. And that was almost a Special Forces assignment. Everybody there was Special Forces qualified. But Special Forces Branch, and the Army, and lots of other people didn't want those units. Uh, we, were, we were transitioning to a much greater role of joint operations. So what happened with the 5th SOSIC, it was the first time it had ever been tried in combat, and it worked very well. It was there to support the Special Forces units in the field, not to command them, not to direct their combat operations, but to support them. Personnel, ammo, whatever they need. It worked extremely well. But as we left Desert Storm, not only did 5th SOSIC go away, but each SOSIC, they had one in, in each of the combatant commands around the world. They all went away, and all those positions went to the joint staff that sorted them out and gave them to the Joint Special Operations Commands in each of the uh, combatant commands. So what I did initially in, in Desert Storm, uh, we supported the special operations uh, that were deployed in whichever way they needed. Then when the war ended, uh, of course it was only a few hours, 100 hours, when the war ended, we didn't have anybody to support there, so I ended up being left with uh, four or five people, not very many. And this was in April, and there was going to be a, a special ops exercise in, in December, and I was doing a little bit with that, but there wasn't a whole lot to do. Most of it was the planning was happening in the States, and they were going to deploy from the States. So I ended up being what they called a ghostbuster for General Pagonis, and I had a group of six or seven, eight people. And when a, a problem showed up in the redeployment, uh, the ghostbusters would go out and try to solve the problem. And I worked a number of issues, uh, material handling stuff, stuff that was out in the field that needed to come back, stuff that was in um, Saudi Arabia that needed to come back to the States, stuff that was in the States that needed to come to Saudi Arabia, and, and that's what I did for most of, uh, from April to December until the exercise kicked off. And as soon as the exercise was over, we packed up mm -hmm. and came home. Desert Storm itself was interesting because when I left Fort Lee to go to Desert Storm, <clears throat> 
the Army guidance was you're not on TDY, you're still assigned to your base, you just go over there and come back. Well, that doesn't work really. So folks at Fort Lee handed me my records, which to me said I'm not coming back here. I took them to Fort Benning, where I processed to go to Desert Storm, watched uh, they had mobilized um, a reserve personnel services company, watched my records get put into a cardboard box with a bunch of reservists, and I got to Desert Storm to the 22nd Support Command eventually. Uh, they had sent me to 18th Airborne Corps. They said, we don't need a Special Forces Lieutenant Colonel. They sent me to 7th Corps. We sure don't need a Special Forces Lieutenant Colonel. So I ended up at Twenty uh, Second Support Command, and that's where Fifth Sosik was working as well. So they were authorized a deputy, but not in garrison. So when they deployed from the states to from McPherson to go to Desert Storm, they didn't have a deputy. So I became the deputy there. But again, uh, not a lot of work because most of it had already been done in the states, mm -hmm. and then they were in and out by the time I got there. I, Desert Storm related, I had a occasion in November to go to a MOA, Military Officers Association luncheon, and I was sitting in uh, the Western North Carolina chapter, I was sitting at the lunch table with a Navy dentist that I've known there for a number of years, and we were swapping tales about why we both got out of the service after Desert Storm. His assignments officer wouldn't support him. My assignments officer wouldn't support me. And I didn't know who the branch chief was at the time because they had just changed. And as I was going in, I had met this uh, Army Colonel, retired Special Forces guy. So after lunch, I went home and looked him up. I'm glad I didn't say anything impolite. He was my branch chief during Desert Storm, <laughs> and he's now a neighbor. But uh, it bothered me greatly that if they could lose a Special Forces Lieutenant Colonel, what were they doing about the privates? They must have been losing them or, or not supporting them as well. And that's really one of the reasons I decided to retire when I came home. I wasn't in good shape. I was physically, I wasn't in good shape. I was, uh, I was old anyway and just had a bad attitude. And I got to Fort McPherson and they told me I had to take a PT test. And I said, I just took one in Desert Storm. Here it is, November. This is only January, March. Oh, that didn't count. You didn't have to take it. I said, I took it. Of course it counts. Oh, no, it doesn't. So I'm sure if I'd have stuck around another day or two, I could have found more reasons to retire. <laughs> One of the things I've picked up, uh, I left active duty in 1970, so I'm not exactly up on a lot of what's gone on since, but uh, there seems to be, and there was at the time, this struggle between these special operations people and regular combat arms. Uh, that continues to this day. Do you th see that there's any resolution coming? Not at all. Uh, and it's unfortunate. There are folks in the Pentagon, they're decision makers, who are convinced that we need a large ground force. 
and of course today it has to be mobile, so it's tank, Bradley, and helicopter. I also just recently read Fred Frank's book on his command of 7th Corps during Desert Storm. And he points out over and over that it was the first time in 50 years that we had done that. And really how opportune it was to prove that the Army could fight that way. Well, yeah, I can fight that way, but will it? Is there a need for it? And I'm not even sure that there was a need during Desert Storm. Uh, we were there, we had the equipment, so they proved it. But Franks was hugely uh, frustrated because it wasn't his war. We had this guy named Schwarzkopf and, and there was the 18th Airborne Corps was over here doing something else and then there were some French and some British. Uh, I taught at the armor school for two years. Oh, that was a tough two years. <laughs> my, uh, my boss, who was reason, uh, removed from the Brigadier General's list, is a, a big Fred Franks and Don Story guy. And every meeting that he chaired whether it was a professional meeting in the office, a family picnic, a beer call, it started, if you ain't cab, you ain't shit. And I just got tired of it and told him one day that I didn't want to be shit, I wanted to be the best soldier I could be. And that relationship sort of went downhill too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, there is still great animosity between those two groups. And part of the solution started in the early 80s when Special Forces, uh, General Abrams, when he was Chief of Staff of the Army, was going to do away with Special Forces. Really? Uh, he was going to replace him with Rangers. He had already done that in Vietnam. He had taken the, uh, the Special Forces camps and closed the ones that were further away from the border and renamed the ones that he left operating as Border Ranger Camps and made the uh, Vietnamese soldiers Rangers and made the advisors all Rangers instead of Special Forces guys. What year was that? Uh, started in 70, hmm. 69, 70. Hmm. And uh, when I was in the 82nd in 73, 74, I had occasion to work on a, a paper. Uh, we had to identify, even within 82nd, uh, personnel spaces that did not necessarily need to be airborne qualified. So he was going to take as many jump slots as he could and move them to Ranger battalions. And eventually ended up with three battalions plus the schoolhouse and the three parts of the schoolhouse. Uh, then he died. Uh, a lot of people do that. So. Part of the solution to the internal fight in the Army was to take, extend Abrams' vision and put the Rangers as a part of the Special Operations Command. And therefore, there would be 
regular army infusion into special warfare centers specifically mm -hmm. and special forces and that has been pretty successful because they have diluted the true spirit of, of what I consider the true spirit of special forces and made it more general special operations. Um, when I first went to special forces training, I was told that there was no organized PT. We were responsible for ourselves, and that someday we were going to be told to do a mission and we better be able to do it. And of course, uh, I, I related to you that in the late 80s, the Special Forces commander at Fort Bragg said everybody would do PT at the 17-year-old level. Uh, there's been a big shift in that. There's been a big shift in missions. We had uh, two Special Forces guys killed just a couple of days ago in Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, they weren't out in the field living with the local people. They were doing direct action combat missions. And that used to be, of the five assigned special forces missions, direct action was the bottom. Uh, Delta Force and the Rangers, they do that well. Special forces teams do not. They don't really even train for it. And when they try to do it, it doesn't turn out well. They, they, the depth of of support just isn't there for a special forces team. And that's why there have been a number of medals of honor for for guys that were trying to do their job and just didn't have the assets, in my opinion. Yeah. I've got a, a retired friend who lives in the D.C. area. He was in uh, Germany with with the same unit. I really didn't even know him. We were only overlapped for a few months as he came in. But we were a traditional Special Forces Battalion with Special Forces A-teams that were designed to work with indigenous peoples and whatnot. And he was regaling me with this story of how uh, not long after he got there, he had convinced them to form a 10-man sniper team. Uh, Halo qualified and scuba qualified and all this other special qualifications. You know, that's that's not the school that I went to, and and there are incessant efforts to to change what special forces was really designed to do. But the bottom line is, there's a lot of folks that would like to see them just go away. Do you get that impression? I did have one question out of your many, many, many awards. Uh, there's a silver star mentioned. Uh, can you describe what that involved? March of 1967 was a busy month. I was actually recommended for two that month. Uh, we were uh, operating out of Fubai at the FOB-1 and going into eastern Laos just across the, the Vietnam-Laos border. And there were a lot of North Vietnamese over there. Not VC, not unconventional. These were hardcore organized heavy units. Uh, the first one uh, that I was recommended for and didn't receive, uh, we went in and at 2.30 in the morning on the first night we were there, we were woken with tracked vehicles. And this is right on the, the Vietnamese border. 
Uh, everybody was denying that any of that was there. Uh, General Westmoreland believed it was and believed us. Um, so later that month, they had sent in a recon team by itself a little bit further south, right along the, uh, the tri-border area in Laos, but a little bit not too far north of uh, Cambodia. And the recon, recon team got into heavy contact. Uh, I believe it was George Sisler, Lieutenant, uh, got a Medal of Honor out of the operation. He also got buried. He killed him on the ground. But they were sending back reports. So we went in, a company size unit, and the first night, I guess it was the first night, the first night we were uh, experienced significant contact during the night in our uh, overnight position. Uh, next day we literally climbed up the side of a almost a sheer cliff and uh, by the time we got there it was late afternoon and we set up a defensive perimeter and there had obviously been some people in there, had dug in, there were some positions. Late at night they allowed us to move in and, and get set up, and late at night uh, there were a number of machine guns in front of us. So it was not a very uh, pleasant evening. I forget how many folks uh, got wounded, most of the Americans, and we had, I don't know, probably 10 or 15 Americans, a couple of captains and arresting COs, and They kept us, uh, even after sunlight came up, uh, they kept us pinned down pretty well. I was at the, actually at the back of the perimeter, and the, um, I was in a uh, quasi foxhole position with the Vietnamese on each side of me. Both of them got wounded, uh, replaced them, moved them to a safer position, replaced them with uh, two other Vietnamese. They both got wounded. Uh, this went on all day long. Uh, Air Force uh, A1Es and uh, Air Force Huey, armed Hueys, which was unusual because most of the, most of the armed Helicopters were either uh, Army or Marine, but we were so far south we were really out of the Marines area. Uh, Air Force pilot, uh, helicopter pilot, got killed, uh, got wounded actually and that helicopter crashed. Uh, we recovered all of them. And eventually we were able to kind of invert and go back down the mountain into a, a river bed where we were able to call in helicopters to take us out. So instead of being at the rear of the area now, it was, uh, they all enveloped through me and came yeah. back down. And Eventually, the helicopter pilot died. He received a Distinguished Service Cross for his efforts that day, as did a couple of other folks on the ground. And I was next to the last helicopter off the ground. And we were actually then uh, working for FOB 2. Uh, 
because Sisler's detachment had been out of FOB2 and because it, there had been so much contact, they had to call and get assistance from FOB1. So it was a, a pretty intense, I guess it was three days. And hmm. almost all the Americans uh, had been wounded. Sisler was killed, got the Medal of Honor. Pilot was killed, got Distinguished Service Cross. There were several other Distinguished Service Crosses. And what we discovered while in there, what Sisler had discovered and, and we kept finding more and more of, it was a huge base area. Uh, very well made and maintained roads under the jungle canopy wow. and supplies and and of course this was the area that uh, this was March of 67 Tet of 68 just nine months later this is right where they came through out of Cambodia into uh, that's where they made their push to take Saigon and were repelled. Wow. My idea of a contact in 69 was maybe 10 minutes. I can't imagine three days. So the, uh, the earlier contact in earlier March in 67, I did get a bronze star for Bella for that, but uh, we had actually gone in company size unit again to recover uh, a Sergeant First Class Borgia whose recon team had been hit. Uh, this was in Laos across from the Ashau Valley. As we were going in, the final helicopter hit a banana tree with the front rotor blade of the CH-46 Marine. And he immediately shut it down and, and landed. And the Marines asked us to secure the helicopter until they could come in and get it, which they never could because the weather came in right behind them. So we were on the ground there for six days and it, even the dumbest North Vietnamese soldier knows when he's got a helicopter sitting on a mountaintop that didn't used to have one sitting there. And, and we were really kind of out in the open. And lots and lots of folks came around us. And we had three recon teams and, and three um, what we called hatchet force companies. And they were supposed to be able to operate with some strength to relieve and assist the recon teams if needed be. So the uh, recon team to my left, young staff sergeant by the name of Howard Carpenter, had carried a shotgun in instead of an automatic weapon. And they were being probed and he kind of jumped up and started cranking off rounds with the shotgun and that went well as long as they were firing and the shotgun jammed and he was standing up and they uh, killed him right away. So a friend of mine by the name of Steve Sherman down in Texas uh, knew that I had been there on that particular operation and November of 2013 Steve sent me an email and said, I think you know about this operation. I said, yeah, I was there. He said, well, the guys out of Hawaii are currently working it, trying to recover Carpenter's body. Uh, would you be interested in joining them? He said, well, it just so happens that I'm in Hong Kong right now, getting ready to get on an airplane this morning to go to Vietnam. So. Steve called the guys in Hawaii and they called me about five minutes later and we lined it up that I could go and make the arrangements and, mm -hmm. and be able to join them. 
So I left Vietnam, left Hawaii, uh, Hong Kong, got to Vietnam, went over to Cambodia, and they had arranged transportation from uh, uh, Siem Rip, Cambodia, to uh, Pakse, Thailand, or Laos. And they picked me up in Pakse and drove me up to what would look like any regular Special Forces A camp, camp in Vietnam, except it didn't have guns all around it. Had helicopters and barbed wire and hooches. And, hmm. and we went in the next day and It was amazing how unchanged, except for the digging that they had done, how unchanged the hilltop was from 1967 until 2013. Wow. I could still identify the, the hole that I had dug. Um, and unfortunately, I rained on their parade. In 1967, the border had gone up the valley and since then, the Vietnamese and Lao have renegotiated it, and the border goes on the ridge line. And that's where we landed, was on the ridge line. And there's a piece of, looks like yellow police tape, don't cross. That's the now the official border. And I told them, I said, well, we left Carpenter on the other side of this line. So we continued to dig that day, but when we came home that night, they notified the embassy. And although they're all little commie brothers, uh, they don't talk to one another. So the Laotians won't let the Vietnamese cross and vice versa. So to, to get to the site where we had technically left Carter, we got to climb up the side of the mountain instead of walking up a, a trail line. So it was a couple of years before they, uh, the Laotians shut it down immediately, but the Americans had to turn the case over to the Americans in Hanoi, and they're now working the site. But I was 70 years old when I walked back up there mm -hmm. in 2013, so I don't think I'm going back again. Wow. But I was told by the embassy, the uh, the U.S. Embassy in Laos, that I was the first American veteran to return to the ground to help with one of those. They had lots of military, but none of them had been there on the ground to do it. They've, they've had a number that go to go into Cambodia and Vietnam to assist on sites. But so he's one of the missing? He's still missing. Yeah. Yep. And it was interesting. They had pictures of the helicopter itself that had rolled over and partway down the mountain. But none of the helicopters there any longer. Scavengers and, yeah. and recyclers have just, uh, in the, I guess it was in the 90s, the Vietnamese had contracted with ties to come in and clean all that stuff up to include stuff left over from the 1950s. Uh, Bernard Falls book, Street Without Joy. Mm -hmm. During the Vietnam War, that the French stuff was still scattered up and down the highway. But it's all gone now. I go back to Vietnam quite a lot. Um, I, I said something about being a Boy Scout in the 50s in Baltimore, and that, that really made a big difference in my life. And I, I started going back to, well, I went back to Vietnam in 1993 to teach. And the guy that I was supposed to teach for says, I don't know any Americans. This was arranged by expatriate Vietnamese from Chicago. So I went back to the hotel and I called and said, you guys got to talk to him. He doesn't know 
So I went back day two and he said, I told you yesterday, I don't know any Americans. Another phone call. Day three, I go to his office and a big smile. He stands up from behind his desk and he sticks his left hand out and he says, why didn't you tell me you were a Boy Scout? <laughs> so that week he took me to see the secretary for uh, youth development who was in Saigon, not in Hanoi, well, in Ho Chi Minh City, not in Hanoi, uh, because they saw a bigger need for the youth of the South to be organized and doing something. So I started working with him in 1993, and last February, uh, I was able to go back to Vietnam, one of many trips now over the uh, past 25 years, and greet the Vietnamese scouts back into the World Brotherhood of Scouting because the, uh, the government has allowed them to mm -hmm. to reorganize and to to become members again. Well, that's one wonderful accomplishment. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I guess we've probably about covered the subjects. Uh, would there be any final words you'd like to impart for your friends, your family, uh, audience at large? Well, I guess the bottom line is that the Army was very good to me, but I was very good to the Army. I gave them myself. I spent more than 15 years overseas, seven and a half of that in combat zones. I thought that's what the Army asked of me. So I, I don't have any regrets. Uh, the field commission, the, the trials of, of trying to be a second lieutenant when I should have been a major general, <laughs> humbly. <laughs> uh, I have really enjoyed life. And, and what I see of life today is that it's out there to be lived and it should be lived. But so many people that are in, think they're in charge of life would like you to live it as a process and not as a content. You have to do A, B, and C. No, you don't. I didn't. <laughs> and, uh, look at what President Trump said the other day at his noon address. You got this, 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 and this, and this, and this is what it made. Look at me. Yeah, I've made <laughs> mistakes, but I've also survived. And uh, Words to the family. It upsets my wife tremendously when I say it, but we don't have any children yet. Um, she's number three wife. It's there's a cost to some things in life. Uh, I met her uh, because of my tour in Korea. I met her a long time ago. Uh, we've only been married. It'll be 15 years this Friday. I needed help at the bus station in Seoul. Uh, getting from the DMZ to Seoul in 1977 was real easy. One two-lane road, one bus. But when I got to Seoul, I, there were more roads and more buses, and I needed to go to a, a briefing at Yongsan headquarters. So I looked around the bus station, and there were a bunch of old men and old women and one young girl and I was just positive that she spoke English because she must have taken it in high school and she was cute anyway. So I spoke to her and it turns out that her father was a captain in the Korean Navy and worked with the Americans. So she gave me her address and invited me to come and visit family when I was finished with my meeting. 
and I did. Her mama loved me immediately, and her mama still lives with us. Her <laughs> dad has passed away. But um, she got married to someone else over the years and came to the States. She, uh, she got married to an American. And he unfortunately was killed a number of years ago. And she had my mother's phone number and address and called my mom and said, uh, introduced herself and said, you know, if he's not busy and he wants to give me a call. So I called her and it turned out we were living less than 10 miles apart from one another and did not know it. <laughs> so after talking with her, she told me I had to get married to her. So we did. Does sound like fate. Exactly what she said. So while we don't have any children yet, uh, we do enjoy the 51 million scouts around the world. And over the past number of years, we've had about 20 of them in our home during the summers. And they are, in fact, our children. And on the 11th of April, I will attend one of them's wedding in Korea. And I've been to several other weddings, and many of them now have children. And so we have grandchildren. But she's got a, a daughter from her first marriage, and we have a five-year-old grandson. And that sounds like a good family. And now he's just become a scout, and they live down in Greensboro mm -hmm. about three hours away. Great. And that's, that's close enough and far enough at the same time. Well, sir, I think I've about exhausted any questions I had. How about you, sir? I'm okay. Okay, sir. Well, I uh, can't thank you enough for this uh, wonderful interview uh, for the History Center, for the Library of Congress, and uh, thank you for your service, sir. It's been a pleasure to listen. It's been my pleasure to, to serve and to do this as well. And Unfortunately, I understand the, the reason for these interviews. We're Got to capture this while it's able to be captured. And our army is not the same as today's army. And that's unfortunate, too. Chief of Staff just said last week 18% of the army is obese. <laughs> oh, yes. <Yeah. laughs> I heard a percentage not too long ago that, what is it, only 11 percent of the American public have any contact, any direct contact with a member serving. So, I Well, and that, too. that was one of my delights of serving at Fort Sheridan, one of my few delights. Fort Sheridan covered a seven-state area and was the only active duty post in that seven states. And when I was in Germany with the first of the 10th Special Forces, John O. Marsh, who was Secretary of the Army at the time, came to visit us. And he challenged us to be the recruiters of the Army and challenged us to wear our uniform and present ourselves to our communities and in the nation. And when I traveled out of Fort Sheridan, which I did regularly, people would ask me about my uniform. I said, it's an Army uniform. Whose Army? <laughs> Yours. And then they closed Fort Sheridan. Uh, and now, people are discouraged from traveling in uniform because of the terrorist threat. So uh, the American public just doesn't know about their army. And unfortunately, we do not have the draft. Uh, I think that was an equalizer in, in many ways. It, it 
forced people to know folks from. It didn't really bring in the rich, but it brought in different races and, and forced people to know other people. Well, we thank you for your service and thank you for doing this. We appreciate it. My absolute pleasure. Thank you.